Hi everybody, I'm Bree the Plant Lady, checking in with a native garden tour. We are officially past the middle of May. Spring needs to slow down. And we got two inches of rain this week, which is the absolute greatest gift that could possibly be given to the gardeners here in Central North Carolina. And everything is looking really, really great. So let me turn the camera around so that you can get an up close view of how these native borders are looking as they turn just about a year and a half old. All right, I'm gonna start in point five, mostly because I want you to see how beautiful the sky is. Um, it's a little warm, but you know what? After two inches of rain, I am not gonna complain about anything. And I am just really pleased with generally how these two big borders are looking. And that, of course, is making me very motivated to go ahead and take on building a whole new big border in the middle. And, you know, it's something we've been talking about for a long time. I think because we have so many plants left over from the sale that we will, in fact, at least get the sod taken out. We might not plant it this summer because keeping it watered is such a challenge. But I think we will go ahead and rip the band-aid off and at least get the space created. Um, we don't need all this turf because we no longer need to uh, rent tents and put tents up in the front yard. So I think these two shrub borders are going to make a lot more sense just contextually when there's one massive border here, which is going to be the woody material is predominantly going to be longleaf pine and then um, native grasses and perennials that can be burned. We're gonna make this big bed in the middle a burn bed. Now, close-ups in this border, the Solidago rugosa is doing great and it's really starting to colonize. A lot of the native perennials do that. They, they spread pretty vigorously. So any edits that I might make in here, I don't need to replace with any more plants. I'm saying that out loud more to myself than anything but we've got this really well loaded and um, I don't need to add any more to it this is really the point now I do of course have some seeded annuals and they bring me an incredible amount of joy no they're not native but I don't care I'm allowed to make exceptions especially for temporary plants like poppies and larkspur um, these are predominantly self-sown from last year and they have really made the bed just so much more special for the last month. And I really like the uh, California poppies and I hope they will continue to naturalize. Um, you can see the penstemons are all in bloom. They are so pretty, but good Lord, they smell terrible. This is not a flower that you wanna bring into your dining room table. Ugh. But I sure do love them. <laughs> Um, all the grasses that we burned are doing really, really well. You can see they've just got great vigor. Um, I, uh, you know, what can I say? It's brimming with plants. I was really hard on myself and just on the general design of this bed over the winter. If you guys remember, we did a, a tour with David Sabio and Troy Martin and Preston Montague and it was just kind of like, uh, it just doesn't look that good. All it took was for the plants to start growing again and everything looks awesome. I especially like this view over to Dennis's bench. And again, it's the Schultzia Californica that really that bright yellow orange, you know, throughout the bed is I think one of the more important elements and definitely gonna focus on continuing to have that as part of this mix as an annual. Well, I'm pleased to show you that the viburnums are all doing very well. Um, Rudbeckia subtomentosa is doing great. You can see uh, this is Echinacea pallida, I think. I don't have it marked. I think it's pallida. Already starting to bloom. The muley grasses are doing wonderfully. The spirea tomentosa and alba are all doing really nicely. They all came back with great vigor. Again, more penstemon. And boy, I sure do love penstemons. I just forgot how bad they smell. <laughs> really giving you guys that tip so that, you know, you're not shocked when they smell like dirty socks. Ooh. And really, I think the only plant that I, I really could see moving and be putting in the back 
uh, is this aronia. And, um, you know, I just don't think that it, it's not coming back with great vigor. So it probably doesn't want to live here. And again, I don't need to replace it with another shrub. I've got plenty of stuff in here. So I think I'm going to go ahead and replace this one. And I have another one in the other bed that I'll show you. And I'm just really excited to see that the Spirea tomentosa is uh, starting to already set flower buds. This is definitely my favorite native shrub. I had no idea how much that I would enjoy native Spireas until I planted these from Carolina Native and wow, they have changed my life. I absolutely adore these plants. And I know the poppies aren't native, but you know, these are self-sown and they were beautiful. I'm just showing you because the finches are starting to steal the seeds. Um, you see how they just tear the seed heads apart. Um, these aren't ripe. This is a stage where you don't do anything to them. But the original ones that bloomed first, the finches have gone in and stolen most of the seeds out of. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of funny. Um, here they are starting to dry. You can see the little holes are opening. So I guess I'll start collecting poppy seeds soon. So stay tuned for videos on that process. All right, so over here to the bed that's mostly flowering perennial ground plane, I want to show you first and foremost that that Coreopsis beetle killed the Coreopsis. Look, they're dead. They aren't coming back. They're literally, look, I can rip them out just like that. So probably should have done something about that, but that's all right. I've got so many other perennials to put in. I'm just not going to invest anymore um with coreopsis because obviously i have a pest issue and i don't really like dealing with pests i'd rather just grow something different um but it killed they killed there was more than one beetle they killed every single coreopsis that was in this bed all throughout they were they were everywhere and you can see big clumps completely dead but that's okay because there are so many other things that are coming into fruition. One of our big tasks, um, now that we're a little bit dry, will be to collect all of this um, crimson clover seed, which is actually very satisfying as you see how easy it pulls off. Um, we do collect our own seed, and this is what we will sell at the spring open garden. Uh, or I'm sorry, the fall open garden, along with bachelor buttons and mustard and uh, poppies and well, all of the other cottage garden stuff that I've been obsessively making videos about. Um, the seed part of a business is something that keeps us occupied all summer. I mentioned the aronia not looking great and, and here it is again. Um, you know, I mean, it is leafing out, but it just doesn't seem to have much vigor. There's a third one over there that looks about the same. So I think we'll just go ahead and, and remove all of these. And we have plenty of space out back where it's more shade, where I think they'll do significantly better. But there's no point in, in torturing them in an in a environment that they don't really want to be growing in. I'm just backing up here because I think this view looks quite nice. Well, as we walk along here, of course, there's a ton of annuals, um, but they're coming, you know, there's, there are so many native things mixed in here. Um, I think we're gonna go ahead and remove the oak leaf hydrangeas. They've also not done very well. Um, and actually probably will replace those with more spirea because I have them. Um, we'll put the oak leaf hydrangeas in the backyard um, under, under some fencing, like with, with some cattle fencing, um, so the deer will leave them alone. The reason these look so bad is because the deer have absolutely devoured them. Um, and I'm actually pretty amazed that this has even come back to this, to this point. Now, once we get all of the annuals out of here, you'll really be able to see all of the perennials. Um, it's great though to see things like Amsonia and Heliopsis and uh, there's a whole bunch of different ornamental grasses and look at the Rudbeckia maxima is already almost ready to start blooming. You can see it, it's already starting to put out flower spikes. 
right there if I can get that to focus. There we go. And I'm definitely thrilled to see the inkberry hollies have leafed out and they're just about to start flowering. Um, there's one southern gentleman in here and the rest are all female. I think that might be the southern gentleman. And oh, really exciting, you guys. The cephalanthus is starting to put out flower buds, which is super awesome. Um, if you're not familiar with cephalanthus, this is one called Fiber Optic from First Editions. And it's a really cool flowering deciduous shrub that the flower itself kind of looks like the COVID structure. The pollinators absolutely love it. So I'll be sure to continue to post updates, particularly as these start to really go into it, their real flowering stage. And in this section, there's a whole lot of monarda. There's echinaceas that are starting to come on. Um, let's see, lots of penstemon, and boy, oh boy, it is stinky on this corner. They are so pretty. My goodness, they smell bad. I know I've said it several times, but I really do mean it. Um, they, they have a real smell. Ooh, ooh, be glad that you don't have a smell of vision on this round. And the Rudbeckia triloba, I love that they have just started to bloom already. And you know, these are just like some of the best plants ever. They bloom basically all summer, all fall. So really long season to be able to enjoy those flowers. So I am getting excited about taking out the seeded annuals um, so that we can really uncover all of the native stuff and um, well, allow that to have some space, give these beds some fertilizer, and uh, let everything really grow out for the summer. Well, the pollinator pocket bed looks great. Um, I am especially in love with all of these Salvia eyes. They are just so colorful and so cheerful. I'm really glad I planted a rainbow of them. I know for some people that's probably tacky, but I don't care. I'm a little bit tacky. <laughs> Um, the Baptisia kind of came and went. They're, they're already finished. I wish they would bloom a bit longer, but it's great to see that, uh, the Echinaceas are really starting to put on a lot of flowers. So probably by the next time I do a tour, Echinaceas will be the star of the show. Of course, here's more Salvia Gregii Alba and more of the Penstemon. This is uh, the one from Proven Winners. Uh, I don't see its label, but it, it really is a pretty one with nice burgundy foliage. And of course the Lychnis coronaria or the Silene coronaria as it is now. That's also not native, but self-sown. And it certainly has added, I, I think, uh, a lot of nice color and texture to the bed. And again, I'm just not gonna get worked up over annuals, whether they're native or not, because they're not permanent. So I'm not putting in non-native perennials, but I don't mind if annuals aren't from North America. <laughs> they're ephemeral. <laughs> of course, this windmill palm is not native. I planted that many years ago, probably 13 years ago for a former neighbor. Uh, but at the base, we've got Baltonia, which I'm anxiously awaiting it to start blooming, uh, California poppies, and the first official coneflower in bloom. And this is a seedling. So this actually seeded from over there. And I'm assuming that the seed ran in like rain and, you know, rooted itself right here on the edge of the bed. Let me say, bed, bed edges are always where plants want to grow. Oh, now we have the Golden Panther to join us for the backyard tour. Well, when I said I have some plants left over, I do. I've got uh, two Cephalanthus. I've got four Father Gilla and actually quite a few Spirea tomentosa, which is great because I want to put them everywhere. We have kind of created a nice shady hangout spot for all of the Airbnb guests who are coming, I think the Airbnb is now rented through the summer for every single weekend, um, which is awesome. That is the goal. 
And I've been contemplating whether I should plant a bunch of ferns under this taxodium. But of course, now that we've been hanging out here, I'm like, I don't know that I really should make this a garden. This is a really nice area to be able to just sit and relax in. But that's okay because we have plenty of shady space to start developing on the back side of the greenhouse and all along that fence line. So let me take you over to show you exactly the areas that I'm talking about. We're, we're hoping that maybe the greenhouse will be done in the next few days um, because once it's done, we can rent a sod cutter and we can start building the beds out. So we're really just waiting, just waiting for the structure to get finished. Um, this side is mostly full sun. I mean, it's in the shade now, but we're at like 5 p.m. But this side is mostly shade all day long. So it's great because we're basically gonna have two completely different environments on either side of the greenhouse to be able to showcase native plants, how they can be in full sun or full shade and all the different species. And that's ultimately my dream with the landscape here is to just show the possibilities of growing natives in a way that feels very suburban friendly. Um, I don't know that I've completely achieved that, but it's still what my aim is. So I think we'll probably start by, you know, establishing beds on this side. And um, we have a slope to deal with, which is sort of exciting. We also have, you know, clay that we brought in. We don't have clay here nat natively on our site. So it'll be interesting to garden in some clay because I I haven't done it in a long time. And then we have this huge fence line, which when it's wet, it's wet. When it's dry, it's dry. So it's gonna be, it's definitely gonna be interesting. My, my dream is to fill the bottom section with all ferns and then have some shrub material and other shade loving perennials on the bank. And we have some cleanup to do. We've got to do some pruning on those crepe myrtles, even though they aren't ours. Um, I'm really excited to get started on this and we could have gotten started this week, but we've decided to take this week off. Aiden and I are both exhausted from the open garden and we had rain two days this week and it's just been kind of nice to have a reset week and actually sit and enjoy the garden instead of constantly being busy and occupied. Now you can see these are all the plants that are left and it's a lot, but once we start getting things planted, I think it's gonna prove to not be a lot. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited though that we've got a good selection, a little bit of everything, almost a little bit of everything. There were a handful of things that we sold out of during last week's sale. But this section is mostly sun, whereas starting here and all the way along the shed is all shade. So we'll definitely be starting with the shade stuff. And then we'll see how much progress we make and then at least get some of the sunny beds created. Whether we get the sunny beds planted or not, it's going to depend on, I guess, how ambitious we are, how naive we are about keeping things watered. I'd say my biggest takeaway so far from the last year and a half of building these new gardens is how hard it is to get plants established. Um, it, yeah, it's been a very humbling experience. Um, and I don't know whether I was just a better waterer 13 years ago, or I think actually we, we were just getting more rain. I don't think my habits have actually changed all that much. But um, I'm really apprehensive about getting full sun beds started in May and June, because we then have to keep everything alive for July, August, September, October, all of which we can easily be in the mid nineties on a daily basis. And rain just isn't guaranteed anymore. And especially with being in an El Nino year, um, we tend to be drier than wetter in those years. And well, 
I'm also on city water. So I mean, part of my apprehension is like, I, I just, I really don't want $500 a month water bills. Um, and that's sort of what it might take to get summer plantings established. So just get it. I'm just saying this um, because I, I want to take it in stride. I need all of you to remind me of this when I get extra ambitious for some reason and uh, start thinking that yeah, I could keep that watered and then everything fails because I'd rather just go ahead and put some effort into potting some of this stuff up and keep it alive and then get it planted in the fall rather than plant it in the ground and then let it die. That doesn't seem like a, a good use of resources at all. Well, I do look forward to sharing more updates, uh, especially as we break ground on building out some new beds and I'm very excited to share the update when the greenhouse is actually finished and we can set a, a ribbon cutting ceremony and actually start planning classes. So I do hope that you will subscribe and continue to stay tuned. And as always, thanks so much for watching everybody. Happy gardening.